The fact is that statistic after statistic, study after study, year after year indicates that immigration is a positive net benefit for our economy, our American economy. Whether you're talking about just getting the job done with today's workforce and today's technology, or you're talking about innovation for the future, you will never see a time in the modern United States, and I go back to maybe the turn of the 20th century for as a point of reference, where immigrants have not been among our greatest inventors, among our greatest business leaders, among our greatest philanthropists. And welcome to another episode of Immigration and Mobility Decoded, a podcast about business immigration and global mobility. We have a great episode ahead for you. It is episode six um, with Ambassador John Feely. And joining me today, as always, is Finn. Finn, how's it going? We're doing good. It's finally spring here in Maine, Eric. How are you doing nice. over in the Midwest? Yeah, it's going It's going well uh, today as we're recording this. Uh, we're recording this intro on April 10th, and the, the sun is out here in Chicago, so can't complain. Uh, how is uh, what, what, what's the spring like in Maine? It it com- comes like hard and fast for the most part. So it goes from winter to like really nice all of a sudden. Uh, and it's pollen central. Everything blooms mm-hmm. really fast. So there's a lot of pollen. I have allergies. <laughs> my girlfriend has allergies. My dog has allergies. So hopefully that doesn't bleed too much into these episodes. Hey, no worries. Uh, I mean. As we're recording this intro, you might see one or both of my dogs pop in uh, into the into the office. Uh, so you know we might have a couple of guests. And hey, if we hear a sneeze, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> so I know uh, we, uh, we we have a decently busy news lineup from this past week in terms of what's going on in the immigration news. Eric, you want to uh, recap some of that for the listeners here? Totally, totally. Uh, so. Yeah, so uh, last or you know the last couple of weeks have definitely been busy in terms of immigration news. I think probably the biggest piece in, ter- in the business immigration world is a federal judge ruled in favor of a Department of Homeland Security regulation that allows the spouses of H one B visa holders to work. Um, and essentially, this decision confirms H-4 employees are lawfully employed. Um, this anal- There's an, al- an analysis uh, from Stuart Anderson on Forbes where he dove into the history of this lawsuit. This has been a couple years um, in, in the courts. Um, and yeah, essentially, I think Finn, before we were recording, we were talking about this. And this is just the firms that H-4 uh, visa holders can work. Um, elsewhere in, in the immigration news landscape, there is an interesting, uh, kind of a look back or history from the Associated Press. Uh, so obviously we are in the year 2023 and time has flown by so much that it's been 10 years since we kind of were almost on the cusp of major immigration reform. Uh, back then, so in 2013, uh, there was the Gang of Eight, a um, group of senators, bipartisan senator, group of senators. Uh, they proposed legislation that would have sought a pathway to legislation for millions of individuals in the country. It would have expanded work visas, tightened border security, and another aspect, it would have mandated employers uh, to verify workers' legal status. That bill back then, uh, it did pass the Senate, but given the makeup of the House of Representatives at the time, uh, the Speaker of the House, John Boehner, never brought it up to a vote. So that uh, legislation died in the halls of Congress. And that was kind of almost the last somewhat bit of a major immigration reform. We haven't seen any movement on anything since then. Obviously, nothing has been passed of, of that magnitude. And and so as such, the last major immigration reform came under President Ronald Reagan all the way back in 1986. And Finn, I think that is a good segue to kind of 
uh, talk a little bit more about uh, this episode's guest, um, Ambassador John Feely. Um, he worked in, in the State Department for a number of years. But Finn, what more uh, should our guests know about Ambassador Feely and kind of the work um, and the career that he has had? Yeah, I mean, he's a really, really interesting guy. And, and you noting the story about it being the 10 year anniversary of the failed Gang of Eight immigration reform bill uh, is something we talk uh, in our conversation with Ambassador Feely quite a bit about. Uh, 10 years since we've even come close to uh, any sort of immigration reform at the legislative level. And like you noted, 30 plus years since we've actually had major immigration reform. And Ambassador Feely was around for, for all of that in his career. So, just a background on him, and, and we'll allude to some of his uh, career uh, successes in, in our conversation that you'll see in just a minute. But uh, Ambassador Feely attended Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Uh, he also attended the National War College later in his career. Um, and out of college, he joined the United States Marine Corps. Uh, he was an officer and a helicopter pilot uh, for a few years in the Marines. Um, following that, he joined the Foreign Service, which for background for the audience, the Foreign Service is the diplomatic core uh, of the of the United States State Department. So it's the actual individuals who are serving overseas at U.S. embassies and consulates uh, and doing the work of diplomacy, consular uh, affairs, which is, you know, oftentimes what a lot of the folks in, in our audience might be more aware of the consular officers who are uh, adjudicating uh, visa applications. Uh, so Ambassador Feely was a, was a Foreign Service officer for decades uh, in the 90s and early 2000s. And um, he eventually rose to pretty prominent positions uh, at the State Department, specifically under Secretaries of State uh, Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice. Um, he served as the, sorry, there's some long, long uh, titles here. Uh, he served as the Deputy Chief of Mission uh, and Charged Affairs in Mexico City. He also served as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs, Deputy Executive Secretary, uh, and of course, Ambassador to Panama, uh, where he served until I believe about 2018 in that role uh, before uh, resigning. And he currently is the Executive Director of the Center for Media Integrity of the Americas, uh, which is part of the Wilson Center, a think tank in Washington, D.C. Um, so Ambassador Feely, as you, as you can hear here, has a robust background of experiences. Um, we spent most of the episode talking to him, not just about those experiences, but about uh, how they have informed his views on the U.S. government's handling of immigration, uh, the future of labor flows between Latin America and the U.S. and Canada, um, an, an area where he has particular expertise on, uh, and much more. So we're excited to share all that. Um, Eric, before we dive into the episode, any Final thoughts on our conversation with Ambassador Feely? My only final thought is for the listeners to make sure that you've eaten beforehand uh, the first couple minutes of our conversation. Uh, there is a lot of food talk, uh, particularly about tacos. So, yeah, make sure yeah, it, it might make you hungry. I know it made me hungry when we were talking with him. <laughs> That's a good point. We were both jealous of uh, all of the destinations that Ambassador Feely's been, uh, been able to... "Quote unquote," serve in, yeah, uh, as he's gotten to enjoy all of the brilliant cuisines that come from those places. Exactly, exactly. Uh, no, but it's, it was a great conversation, and um, I had a lot of fun talking with him. And excited for everyone to hear that conversation. Uh, but before we get there, just a quick uh, reminder that if you aren't already, if you're watching on YouTube, definitely would appreciate uh, a subscribe and a follow on this video, so you can stay informed of when we drop our latest episodes. And if you're listening on Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts, definitely give us a follow uh, to keep the show growing um, and all that good stuff. And so with that, our conversation with Ambassador John Feely. All right. And with that, we'd like to welcome Ambassador John Feely. Welcome to the podcast. Well, many thanks, Finn. I appreciate it. We're super excited to have you here. Um, there's a lot we want to get into today, a lot of questions we want to ask you about your career path, about uh, your thoughts on the current state of uh, immigration and labor flows in the Americas, um, and just diving into your expertise. But first, we want to give the audience a bit of a chance to get to know you. So we gave you a bit of an intro uh, before you joined the call and explained your, your career path, your background a little bit. Uh, you spent a lot of time in Latin America, so I wanted to ask what your favorite uh, Latin American cuisine is. 
<laughs> Without a doubt, it is Mexican street tacos. Uh, they are the real thing. Uh, if they cost you more than seven to eight pesos a piece, you're overpaying. And they are about the best thing I can think to eat. They're one of my like anytime, anywhere foods. I think that's a solid choice. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have a partner who is of Honduran descent. And so anytime we're over at uh, her mom's house, we get to enjoy all of the best, uh, what are typically, you know, considered peasant food, but is the most delicious oh. you know, rendition of black beans you've ever had in your life. So I'm jealous you got to spend so much time down there. Totally. One of the things that you realize after you spend a little time in Latin America and pretty much anywhere, I think, is that the real joke in this life is, is on foodies. Um, I have a lot of friends who spend a lot of money to eat one bite of something that's been exquisitely crafted. And, you know, I don't take anything away from the culinary artistry, but man, you just give me a good pupusa, give me a good taco, and get me set up with, you know, some, some good ceviche in Peru or Panama. I'm good to go with the street food. So that begs the question for me then. What's the what's the favorite country, city, place that you've either visited or lived? I'll I'll leave it open for you. That's really tough because I've uh, I've lived in a bunch of places, and um, you know, uh, you you hold a gun to somebody's head and go, "All right, pick what's the favorite." You know, what's the desert island disc? You're going away. You're never going to listen to anything else, and so it's kind of a forced question. I will tell you, uh, I, I'll, I'll cheat and tell you that uh, there's three. Um, very much at the top, and perhaps if I did have that imaginary pistol, water pistol to my head, I would say Mexico City. I had the privilege of serving there for almost seven years, over two tours. Um, and, you know, Mexico is one of the greatest misunderstood places in the American psyche. Um, I was in Colombia in the 1990s, and unfortunately, what most Americans know about Colombia is, you know, Netflix and Pablo Escobar. Colombia is an amazing place with some just unbelievable biodiversity, and I had such a blast uh, living in Colombia in the in the in the early 90s. And then, you know, sort of last, uh, not last. I mean, like I said, on any given day, it depends sort of what's going on, what's the event. What would you go where for kind of thing? Um, but Panama, uh, Panama is another just fascinating place that has this over a century long history with the United States. It's home to one of the greatest engineering marvels in the world, the Panama Canal. And that continues to be a really relevant, important maritime waterway. You know, if you're buying a flat screen TV somewhere on the East Coast of the United States, you can thank the toll master in the Panama Canal because it almost certainly rolled through there or floated through there. So I would put those three up there. But frankly, uh, every country is marvelous and um, and every country has its problems, too. And then again, just back on the on the uh, theme of you having lived all over the world, what do you do for fun when you're not working, when you're not uh, either being a busy ambassador, or busy foreign service <laughs> officer? Uh, what, what do you do for fun? You surf in Panama? You're just only eating Mexican street tacos? <laughs> well, I do eat a lot. Uh, that's uh, and, and eating is definitely uh, one of the great things about being a diplomat is eating actually counts as work sometimes. Um, but no, what I... You know, there's a, there's a word in Spanish that uh, is called sobremesa. Sobremesa translates into basically, literally means over the table. But what it is, is dinner table conversation. And, and I was enormously fortunate in my, in my life because I got to make that kind of conversation, which is for me a real joy, just fun, meeting new people, interesting people, um, I got to do that in the service of American interests wherever I went. And, and so, you know, I don't have a, a very clearly bifurcated professional life and private life, fun life and work life. Um, I was lucky. And, you know, I, I recognize a lot of people don't have that and, and not every profession affords that. Um, but what I did for work I honestly can say I considered fun.
that's awesome to hear, Ambassador Feely. Um, quick question though. So, are you a flour tortilla or corn tortilla? Oh, corn. Corn. There you go. Stop. There you go. <laughs> Stop. That's like you know. That's like uh, I don't know. Um, you know, when you play golf, do you like the windmill tea or do you like the Mickey Mouse mouth tea? <laughs> no, there's one tortilla. It is made from something called nixtamal, which is the indigenous mix uh, that is made from, you know, uh, traditional Mexican corn. And uh, yeah, no, that tortilla over a little sterno flame, <laughs> a little Oaxaca cheese. Uh, maybe you throw some suadero or carnitas in there and man, then you're talking. Uh, you're making me hungry. I ate before <laughs> this, but I'm, I'm getting more hungry uh, by the minute. Uh, but Ambassador Feely, uh, can you uh, talk, tell us about your career trajectory from Georgetown to U.S. Ambassador? Sure. Um, number one, it was not planned. Uh, as most things in life, you know, the best laid plans of mice and men off go astray. Um, and a, a famous um, Prussian war theorist uh, named uh, von Clausewitz uh, once wrote, the very best battle plans do not survive first contact with the enemy. I thought when I went to Georgetown as an undergrad that I was going to go into, I, I, I was always interested in international affairs. Um, and I did think that I would go into something like international law, international finance, um, I studied the traditional sort of foreign service undergraduate menu at, at, at uh, Georgetown, graduated in 1983 with a bachelor's um, in international politics. So it's not like the international realm was, you know, I completely fell into the pool without realizing it. But my father very helpfully <clears throat> assisted me in my career decision making. He told me in my senior year, hey, pal, you got two younger sisters. There ain't no money for grad school. So that was pretty helpful. Uh, and in 1983, there was a pretty bad recession here in the United States. And um, so law school was out at that time anyway. And I had also had what I considered to be the best, worst internship of my life. Um, the year prior, I had been able to wrangle an internship in the city of London at the old Chase Manhattan Bank. And I basically was, you know, a staple and three hole punch expert. This was the era before email. Um, and what it afforded me was this incredible experience as at a young age, you know, 21, go live overseas, kind of survive in a foreign environment, and at the same time, watch and see what bankers do. And I came away from that experience knowing that I would slip my veins if I did what bankers did. But boy, I wish I could sort of live where they lived and do what they did in their off hours, which was go out and explore foreign cultures. So when I came back to Georgetown, uh, I'd had those two sort of seminal guiding experiences, uh, my old man telling me that the uh, bank of dad was closed and um, the, the idea that I was not going to go into international finance. And I honestly was sort of up in the air and I didn't know what to do. And I went and looked at joining the armed services and, um, you know, a lot of conversations later, it turned out that I could join the Marine Corps and they would give me the possibility of becoming a pilot if I could pass some real Mickey Mouse basic tests, quite frankly. Um, they weren't terribly tough. And, um, and that's what I did. So I spent the first seven years of my career as a Marine Corps helicopter pilot. And I did achieve the get yourself overseas goal. I spent a lot of time flying in and around Lebanon. Uh, folks may recall in the 1980s, there was a lot of the civil strife there, there was a civil war going on, there were terrible bombings. 1983, the Marine Corps barracks was bombed. Uh, I joined uh, in 1983, so that kind of dominated us for the next couple of years. I flew all over North Africa, Europe, uh, whatnot. And um, in 1990, 
uh, seven years later, uh, it came time to either re-up or get out. And the downside of a military career is that you are gone all the time. And so, you know, when people say thank you for your service to the men and women in our armed forces today, um, they should mean it. They should understand that what that means. I was in a peacetime uh, military, a wartime military. You're always gone. And so I had gotten married. I had two young children. And, you know, I did not have domestic tranquility on the home front. And if I <laughs> decided to re-up and go back out on the ship and, you know, fly with my, with my buddies in the squadron for six to eight months at a time, um, my wife was going to be very disappointed. My wife had also gone to Georgetown. She was, one, she was interested in working. And so we were very fortunate. We took the Foreign Service exam. We passed the Foreign Service exam. Back then, it was all paper. You know, you waited for the envelope to come, and you prayed it wasn't a thin envelope. You prayed it was a fat envelope because that meant you got to fill out more forms to, you know, schedule your physical and whatnot. And so long and the short of it is, by the end of 1990, both my wife and I were working as Foreign Service officers in the United States Embassy in the Dominican Republic. That, quite honestly, was my first real brush with immigration and immigration policy. Um, I, I was a child and a product of immigration when I grew up, but it was kind of like background noise. Nobody really paid attention to it. Um, it never was the kind of headline, frontline issue that it is today. And even in 1990, I can say it was nowhere near as contentious an issue. But as a young visa officer um, for a couple of years in the Dominican Republic, I got a, I got a bird's eye view and, a, and, you know, a ringside seat, whatever other metaphor you want to use into how people make the decision that they're going to uproot themselves from all that is familiar and try to come to the United States. So it was pretty fascinating. So that raises an interesting point because the 1990s, when you're first getting your career kicked off in the Foreign Service, that was really the the era of the introduction of the modern immigration system. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, 1986 the, with IRCA, the Immigration yeah. Reform Control Act. Um, the you know, and again, you have to be real careful about the language you use in immigration, but the amnesty. And you know, there are people who are cynical and say. Uh, that the United States, you know, really since the time of its founding and the idea, you know, maybe in the beginning of the 20th century, we will go periods of time when we kind of open the doors um, with greater or lesser scrutiny because we need the labor. And then there's a political backlash and we shut the door. And then you know, the Second World War, so you go from, you know, the 1880s to about, you know, the, the teens, 20s, um, and that's when you start to get to see things like the Chinese Exclusion Acts. Um, then you have, but you still have, for example, when my family, Italians and Irish from Europe, when they immigrated to New York, you have massive immigration. These people go on within a generation or two to become our presidents become our leaders, to become our CEOs, to start our Fortune 500 companies. Um, but you have the backlash, the political backlash. So then we shut down for about 30 years. Second World War starts up. We need workers. What do we do? We go and we start the Mexican Bracero, which means strong arm program, right? Guys to come in and take the jobs that Americans who are now working in munitions factories or fighting on the front lines in the European theater, the Asian theater, um, we depend on those people. Uh, then you get a, a period after the war where we see a big dip in migration, not as much demand. Um, and in the 80s, you start to see it ramp up a little bit. And we get our first major reform. And sadly, our last major reform in the modern era in 1986 during the Reagan administration. And, you know, for people who don't follow the issue as closely as some, you know, they'd be shocked to know that it was a Republican president, the, you know, the, 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 the patron saint of Republicans, frankly, uh, that made the decision, look, if you're already in, you've kept your nose clean, you're working, come out from the shadows, 
we're going to regularize your status here. And then we're going to, you know, start over, start fresh. And that's where our modern visa categories come from, from that congressional overhaul. In your view, what's changed since then, since the late 80s, early 90s, when you had Congress and two administrations in a row, Reagan and Bush, like you mentioned, who were willing to uh, tackle the issue of immigration, bring forth innovative reforms to improve the system overall? And in the last 30 years or so, we haven't seen really any major change or any major improvement improvements to these uh, to these systems that have been around, you know, for 30 years without any update, although the labor market's changed, the economy's changed. Uh, what, what do you, what, what do you, you know, attribute to that? Yeah, several things. And it's a great observation, Finn. You know, uh, one thing that's really true, uh, life goes on. People make decisions about themselves and their lives. And, um, if government and law doesn't keep pace, a lot of times it becomes obsolete, and that is clearly what we have had happen in the United States. So a couple things happen. Number one, actually two major technological things happen. One is the jet engine and air travel, modern air travel. Two is telecommunications and the ease with which you can take one of these and you can call from Miami to Buenos Aires, and it doesn't cost you anything. That obviously didn't happen overnight. That's been a technological evolution. But the fact is that migrants today are more connected to their home countries than at any point in the past. Again, I go back just one, two generations. My grandparents, when they got off a boat, they never knew if they were going to go home again. They had no reasonable expectation that they would make the trip back across the Atlantic. They came with a view to start a new life in the United States. For many of today's migrants, it's about labor mobility. And that doesn't just mean the high end of the labor market. It's the same thing for a day worker who's picking lettuce in the Imperial Valley in California as it is for a programmer coming out of Bangalore. The idea is that there is a huge market and requirement for their skills, whatever they are, high skill, low skill, medium skill, here in the United States. They obviously want to cash in because it's better than the labor market offerings where they may be, where they're born from. But there's not necessarily the desire to uproot yourself culturally and family-wise and emotionally. I mean, being a migrant is tough work. It's not easy. Um, and a lot of people forget that. I think a lot of Americans who have the privilege of being native born, who, who, who you know, haven't, and it's not, a, it's not a criticism of them. There's no reason for an American, if he or she doesn't choose to, to go out and explore this big, bad world. But we are an enormously privileged nation. And so... You know, you could take your whole life and just visit the national parks on vacation. You don't have to go to Paris. Um, we tend often to assume that all migrants who come here want to come to overstay their visa and get on public services. And nothing could be farther from the truth. The fact is that statistic after statistic, study after study, year after year indicates that immigration is a positive net benefit for our economy, our American economy. Whether you're talking about just getting the job done with today's workforce and today's technology, or you're talking about innovation for the future, you will never see a time in the modern United States, and I go back to maybe the turn of the 20th century for, as a point of reference, where immigrants have not been among our greatest inventors, among our greatest business leaders, among our greatest philanthropists, among our educational leaders. And, you know, the again, though, that stereotype of somebody coming and, you know, draining social services in a Midwestern city uh, or the Texas border, the way it looks right now, which is pretty terrible. Um, those are the images again, because of modern telecommunications, 
that saturate the American mind, and it's not a full picture of the reality of immigration. And I think, yeah, I think to your point about the innovation part, I mean, we look back in the last couple of years since the pandemic started, a lot of the tools that we use to work remotely or order groceries or move around, immigrant inventors, immigrant CEOs. Um, and I'm curious, uh, Ambassador, um, you mentioned, you know, the change in administrations the last, uh, you know, time we saw a moderate or, you know, an overhaul of our immigration system was under President Reagan. Mm -hmm. With every with every president, they have a secretary of state. Um, some presidents have more than one secretary of state. In your view, who has been the most effective secretary of state in the last 50 or so years and why? Really good question. Um... So if we go to the last 50 years, I got to do math in public, which is never a comfortable thing for me. But if we go back to the 70s, right, you've got people up there like Henry Kissinger, kind of the default to the to the big names. Um, I'm going to be bipartisan here, and that is not because uh, I, I'm consciously trying to cover all bases and use all the right pronouns. But the fact is that the two best secretaries of state, and actually, I'm sorry, I'm going to say three. The three best secretaries of states were George Shultz, Colin Powell, and Hillary Clinton. And why do I say that? I say that because all three of them, though they came from incredibly different backgrounds, George Shultz, Republican, business guy, um, old Marine, kind of like me, so that's pretty cool. Uh, but he, he didn't do a full career, you know, he was like me, he just did it for a couple of years and then got out, but, but he's basically a business guy. He's a, he's a heavy economics guy. Um, he was absolutely, I think, empowered by the president. And that's one of the first things that has to happen for a secretary of state. When you're dealing with foreign affairs, where the president by constitutional authority has much greater remit than he does when you're dealing with domestic affairs. They've got to empower that Secretary of State. And so there are two roles that a Secretary of State can play. One is to be the president's BFF and main foreign policy whisperer. And the other is to be a, an institutional leader of the organization known as the Department of State. My reason for selecting those three is because although they were very different and very different in their leadership styles, they all embraced both roles. Um, George Schultz was absolutely uh, relentless in making sure that the career foreign service, which is tiny, tiny, we're a country of 335 million people, you know, we have maybe 12 to 13,000 professional diplomats. And that's that's unbelievable when you think about it as a, as a percentage of the nation. Uh, Colin Powell, without a doubt, was the most visible in the organizational leadership role. Interestingly, he comes to that job after he's been everything else and kind of, you know, is a household name, almost presidential candidate. Uh, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a I guess what they would call today a rhino or Republican in name only. But the guy has got immense popularity and for personal reasons, um, which I, I had the privilege of working directly with Secretary Powell for, for two years. For personal reasons, he chooses not to run. Interestingly, he was not the policy whisperer for George Bush 43. He gets elbowed out by a lot of the neocons and Doug Feith and Scooter Libby and most, most prominently Dick Cheney, the vice president. When you go back to those years when he was Secretary of State 2000, 2004, it's 9-11, it's, it's the invasion of Afghanistan to go after Osama bin Laden, and then it is the sort of mission creep morph into the invasion of Iraq. Colin Powell is there. It was a horribly, horribly disruptive time for the Foreign Service. I can honestly say that 
the career people never felt as well supported by Powell. And I fundamentally believe that in his role as presidential foreign policy whisperer, he was the voice of moderation that I wish had been listened to. And then finally, you get to Hillary Clinton. She comes at a very different time. She is working for a rock star president who came out of nowhere, right? A two year senator out of Illinois. But Barack Obama gets a Nobel Prize for nothing, basically, just for not being George Bush 43. And they run against each other. And I think it was a tremendous testament to Hillary Clinton's sense of public duty and service that she agrees to become Barack Obama's uh, Secretary of State. And just like Powell, in a very different leadership style, but just like Secretary Powell, she actually really cares about the Department of State, about the people around the world, about the interagency that populates embassies. She institutes a whole boatload of internal reforms meant to promote diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, one of the best things she ever did, uh, in my view, was to sort of decree, and it turns out, lo and behold, she could decree it, that diplomats who had same-sex domestic partners, um, this remember, this is before um, the idea of same-sex marriage is legalized in the United States. But she basically makes the call that says, if you are a same-sex domestic partner living overseas, accompanying your partner who is a career diplomat, you will have access to all of the same health and administrative services and support that the diplomat does. That was ground shaking and, and enormously welcomed, obviously. So I would put those three up there. They're, 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 they're my modern favorites. It's quite a list of heavy hitters when you look back in history at, at those names and think about it. Um, I want to go back to your comments on Secretary Powell. Um, under him, I know you served, and under a few secretaries of state, you served in uh, several high-level positions focused on Latin America and the Western Hemisphere. And I want to pivot the conversation back to uh, how immigration trends have changed from those regions to the United States and vice versa in the last 20, 30 years. Um, one thing that's caught my eye and has been picked up in the media a fair amount has been uh, the trend of uh, of of during this transition to remote work in the last few years, the trend of, as opposed to folks coming from Costa Rica or Mexico to work in the United States, there's a reverse migration going on with folks going yeah. from the U.S., going from Costa Rica and Mexico to work for their, you know, work their corporate job remotely in those destinations. What are the countries in Latin America doing, in your view, that is promoting this reverse migration? And what is your outlook on the future of labor flows between the U.S. and Latin America in general. Yeah, that's a that's a totally cool issue and a brave new frontier. And for you know somebody my age uh, looking at it, I see it as enormously exciting. Um, on a personal level, I just spent the last three and a half months in Puerto Rico because uh, I'm old and I get cold and I don't like the winter. So I went down and I have I'm very fortunate. I have family down there, and I went down and I spent three and a half months working. I never missed a beat. I, I do several things, but I could do everything remotely when I had to travel. I just got on a plane that originated in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and I flew to wherever my stuff was, and I came home. Um, I can't tell you the number of young Americans and young Russians and young French and German and uh, Mexican people that I met down there, all doing the same thing I was doing, which was doing a productive job, almost always in the knowledge economy, right? Nobody's stocking shelves from Puerto Rico's beaches, but they, where you can do this, why not do this? And so what are, and you see that all over the hemisphere. Um, one of the things to keep in mind uh, about our hemisphere is that by and large, it is in the same time zone. So, you know, you and I could be doing this podcast right now with one of you located in outer Mongolia, the other one in Berlin, and me sitting here in D.C. It wouldn't make a difference, except 
for the guys sitting in outer Mongolia and Berlin, it's really late at night and you don't want to be up doing it. So what I've found is that the countries of the Western Hemisphere have become enormously popular as destinations for digital nomads because it syncs with the same, roughly same time zone as the United States. And uh, so, you know, they can sit there and they, they can zoom into their meeting or Microsoft Teams, whatever the platform is. They can zoom into their meetings, they can do their phone calls, and they can more or less keep the same kind of work day. You know, if you're in Europe physically, you know, you're a minimum of four, a maximum of nine hours ahead. Uh, if you're in Asia, you know, in most cases, you're 12, 13, you know, 12 or 11 hours or 13 if you roll over the top of the clock. Um, and and so there's a huge attractive, uh, I think, um, destination marketing tool for a lot of these countries. And they're using them. I mean, look, let's face it. Uh, Envoy Global does this, you know, annual survey, which is a fantastic barometer of global labor mobility and attitudes toward it. One of the things they found, which is not surprising, is that American business is losing out getting their best workers into the United States physically because the government's system of work permits and, and visas, et cetera, is so bad and so slow compared to Mexico and Canada. And so Mexico and Canada, you can't take anything away from them. These guys are saying, hey, we're the same time zone. We can get you. We can get you close to your headquarters in Omaha, Nebraska, or Evanston, Illinois, and we have street tacos if you go south. You know, if smoked meat if you go up to Montreal. Um, but but I guess the point is that I really do see. I don't see the nation state ever breaking down. I don't see concepts of sovereignty and nationality breaking down. But I do see the future of labor markets as being far less pegged to those concepts of a physical location and a nation state. And how do you, how do, you know, Latin American countries that in the news are mostly talked about for, uh, you know, crime and gangs and yeah. uh, all this stuff, Honduras, yeah. Nicaragua, um, how do you see their future and how those populations might integrate eventually into uh, some of these more high skilled or, or trade skilled labor flows in between the US and Latin America and Canada? Yeah. Well, look, you have to sort of go sub region by sub region, but it is undeniable that, a, that in, for the last several years, uh, in the last decade, I would say, the immigration that we see coming out of the Northern Triangle, as it's called in Central America, which is um, Guatemala, um, uh, El Salvador, and Honduras. Um, and then you go down a little bit further and you get Nicaragua gets included in there. From those four countries, the immigration is, um, is tragic. Um, it is generally low skilled people who are voting with their feet, as we used to say. Uh, life at home, whether it's because of a climate wrought change uh, that has ruined coffee crops uh, throughout the region, whether it is because business has dried up because government and good governance is so poor and corruption is so rampant, whether it's because of in Nicaragua, because you have a dictator who has pretty much consolidated all state power into his family's hands, you have kind of the classic Emma Lazarus Statue of Liberty, you're tired, you're poor, you're huddled masses. Uh, I think it's enormously important that Americans, while recognizing that sovereignty matters, borders matter, safe, legal, um, and orderly migration matters, that Americans don't completely put out of their mind the, the human tragedy of so many of those people who are migrating and that we see on the nightly news stacked up at the border in Mexico. Um, many of those people, um, the, well, first off, the vast majority of those people, if they are granted legal access into the United States, I can almost guarantee you 
um, with very few exceptions, very small historical minority. They will be extremely law-abiding, frequently more law-abiding than normal Americans because they don't have papers and they're scared about getting caught and getting deported back to where they came from. And the second generation generally has a quantum leap forward in its socioeconomic standing. So the bet that these people are making for as uneducated and as unsophisticated as they may be, um, it, they, they ain't wrong. Um, you know, again, they have a phone, they have WhatsApp, they have video conferencing, they see what their sister's kid is doing at school and what their kid is doing at school. And so I think a lot of these people come here just as my grandparents did with a view towards, all right, I'm going to sacrifice myself. I'm going to uproot myself from everything I know, everything that's comfortable, my language, my cultural traditions, my church, uh, my family. And I'm going to take a chance that my kid will live a better life than me socioeconomically. Um, the, that's one class of migrants. Okay, and in that group, when you look at Latin America, we see increasing numbers of Haitians. That's a failed state. There's just no way, you know, I, I wouldn't say that if I was still in the State Department um, because it's a little too sensitive. But as a private citizen, I look at Haiti. It's a failed state. Um, people are fleeing because they are literally miserable and starving. You take a look at the Cubans who are coming in now. They're just fleeing good old-fashioned dictatorship, which no longer has the ability to support itself because communism doesn't work as, a, as an economic system and state-driven economies just don't work that well. Um, Venezuelans are, are huge numbers of these, these migrants. They call them caminantes in Venezuela. They're walkers and they literally walk across Colombia walk into the Darien jungle, one of the most inhospitable and godforsaken hellscapes on the planet. And they literally drag their kids and their babies through there, again, all with this hope to get to the United States so they can get a job at Wendy's, so they can get a job blowing our leaves, so they can get a job doing whatever they can to get that chance on the next rung up. That is undeniably one face of Latin American migration to the United States, but it is not the only face. I also would encourage people to go to places across the country, not just New York, Miami, Texas, California, where we traditionally think of enclaves of Latin Americans living in the United States. Go to North Carolina and go to Iowa. There are all kinds of mid-range and high-end Latin Americans who are coming to the United States legally, getting the visas that, uh, with all of the problems that there are associated with that, they're getting J visas to come study. They're getting, uh, you know, professional trader visa, visas uh, with intercompany transfers. Um, and those people are here and they are high or higher skilled than the ones you'll see routinely on the nightly news. And they are contributing to our economy. And as we said earlier, they are, if not they themselves, among their children are the innovators of tomorrow. And one thing we know about, you know, studying our own, our own species since we started doing agricultural farming on the banks of the Nile 10,000 years ago is, Technological innovation never stops. It will continue. So we can't even begin to predict what kinds of things will be invented or perfected or shaped by the children immigrants of today in the American society of tomorrow. In your opinion, Ambassador, what risks does the United States face if the country doesn't modernize its immigration system the next five, 10, 15 years? Yeah, that's a tough question because the last thing anybody wants to do is doom scroll. Um, and that's kind of what it would naturally lead to in my mind anyway. 
I confess that having watched immigration policy, participated in implementing it in embassies, um, I am amazed that it is still stuck at such an impasse. Now, I recognize we are in enormously polarized times politically in the United States for a whole host of reasons. Um, but probably since the 60s, uh, definitely since the 60s, we have not been this polarized. And I, I don't know, I will leave it to the historians to say if we're more or less polarized than we were in the 1960s with, you know, the cultural revolution, the uh, civil rights legislation, things like that. But if we don't make our economy a more welcoming place to bring people with the skills we know we need, I mean, don't forget, and it's not just uh, the, the, the Envoy Global uh, survey, you can go to any source you want and it will tell you that American universities, which are still among the very best universities in the world and are a natural attraction and a, and a, and a jewel in the crown of American society, um, we're not producing the engineers. We're not producing the programmers. We're not producing... Uh, the agronomists. We're not producing the doctors uh, we need um, in the United States. Uh, you know, I mean, again, stereotypes are always dangerous, but stereotypes emerge because there's a grain of truth in some, uh, or there's a, a grain of common experience in them, and everybody kind of recognizes it. So please think about the last time you went to the doctors. Was it a native-born American who was your doctor? Was there a non-native American in the office serving in a technical capacity? Um, it's true across many, many, many of our most important job sectors. And I think that uh, to answer your question, Eric, if we don't modernize, if our elected politicians are unable to put aside or to factor in whatever political polarization is driving them at this point not to make a deal, the only losers will be the American people and the American economy. I think that's a wise note to end on, Ambassador Feely. You've been very generous with your time. Uh, I feel like we barely got the chance to scratch the surface uh, of your knowledge and your stories and your expertise. So hopefully we'll have the chance to have you back and dive more into your time in Panama, your time in the Marine Corps, and um, you know maybe different cuisines that you like other than just pupusas and Mexican street tacos. But um, uh, I could go all day on the food. And if we have beers the next time, if, if we bring a beer along, the only thing I would do is I would make sure that you set that clock because I'll just keep going until you shut me <laughs> off. <laughs> that sounds like a great that sounds like a great episode to me. And <laughs> hey, we'll put a poll out in the audience and see what they think. Uh, All right, see if, of that. What do you want? Do you want to see Feely have a beer and talk? <laughs> and if if you get if you get a couple that raise their hand, I'll show up and do it. <laughs> we'll call in uh, Cervezas and former ambassadors. Maybe you can get there you your go. friends like to join it. too. <laughs> uh, well, Ambassador Billy, any final thoughts before we close out here? Uh, anything you wanted to share? We didn't even get a chance to talk about your current role uh, at the Wilson Center, but any final thoughts just before we close out? Just uh, thank you for the opportunity. It's marvelous to be able to talk to your audience. Um, and uh, for people to think, uh, the, the only thing I would do is I would encourage people that when they think about immigration, the first thing they should do is challenge their preconceptions. The second thing they should do is they should think about how they might be able to participate in pushing perhaps the political process in their state, their county, the whatever, towards a scenario where there is greater receptivity in the United States to this notion of labor mobility. We are no longer a you know, country that is, is founded uh, or that exists in a vacuum. Uh, globalization happened. Whether people want to accept it or not is another thing. But globalization happened. It will continue to happen. And I know there are losers and winners in all of this. And there are plenty of communities in the United States that feel that they have not benefited from it. But if they're listening, figure out how you might be able to help those communities adjust and then figure out how you might be able to 
contribute your time, your energy, your wisdom, or even just your opinion to an environment where immigration is not a dirty word, it's actually a force multiplier. Awesome. I really appreciate that call of proactiveness. I think that's uh, something that doesn't get brought up enough in these conversations. So Ambassador Feely, we really appreciate your time and uh, we hope to have you back soon. You guys let me know when. Hey everyone, thank you for tuning in to Immigration and Mobility Decoded. Uh, if you watched this video on YouTube and you enjoyed it, please hit the like button and consider subscribing to the Envoy Global YouTube channel for more content like this. Uh, otherwise, please follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks, everyone.